Okay, so coming back into session <clears throat> and just settling for a moment. Regather your focus inward. All sentient beings, who although self and all appearances are dharma dhatu by nature, have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay, so you've just done the meditation with Yangzi Rinpoche, um, the Mahamudra style meditation. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting to see that he's using the same basic framework that Roger uses, um, but with slightly different word choices, slightly different pacing, but, you know, it amounts to the same point. And the structure remains the same. Of course, there's going to be stylistic differences depending on who is leading it. But I think that um, hearing a few different angles on the same meditation can maybe give us confidence that we can do this by ourselves. Um, we realize if we know the essential steps, it's a matter of just having a try, kind of, you know, inelegantly, not perfected, not completely sure of ourselves, but just try see what happens sometimes to do this by yourself and you know to not be too worried about what is it exactly that i'm looking for what is it exactly that i'm supposed to find in this style of meditation it's really riding the wave of the understandings you come to before you get to the cushion yeah so before you get to the cushion you study about the mind, you study about emptiness. When you get to the cushion in this Mahamudra context, you allow that to imbue the way you concentrate, but it's not the contents of your concentration. You know, at, at that point, you just kind of release into it. So, you know, it, it can be a little abstract, which is why I also keep coming back to equanimity. And equanimity, you know, especially immeasurable equanimity that we're working on as our daily life foundational practice for kind of perfected empathy, for lack of a better word, or um, a very stable foundation for loving kindness and compassion. This equanimity is at its heart an examination of dependent arising. And you know now that when you examine dependent arising, it directly points you to why things are empty. So there's a direct relationship there. It's just in terms of which is going to give you the most sustainable experience, the most impact in daily life. And probably they both do, which is why it's good to alternate Mahamudra style meditation with equanimity style meditation things that are less tangible with things that are more tangible, but it's all kind of part of this holistic picture of understanding how to work with both relative truth and ultimate truth. So that I just briefly kind of go back to equanimity and, um, and then move into some more about how to really 
understand this clarity of mind that we're trying to touch and to realize is empty. Um, and then we'll do some more verses. So equanimity, just remembering that there are many types, right? This same word gets used in a, many different contexts. So such as the feeling of equanimity, the equanimity of the four immeasurables and so forth, the equanimity present in the second dhyana is the virtuous mental factor of even-minded equanimity that balances the mind and its accompanying mental factors. So this balancing quality, even if we haven't achieved the second dhyana, even if our concentration is not particularly perfected, still it's all got that kind of um, atmosphere of balance. The atmosphere of balance, which is not a pure neutrality that like doesn't care. It's, it's very much at its heart a balance, whether it's the second dhyana, whether it's the feeling of equanimity, whether it's the equanimity of the four immeasurables, all of them have that atmosphere of balance. It's just a slight variation in where that experience comes from or where it's directed to. So equanimity of the 11 virtuous mental factors that we studied when we did minds and mental factors, this is just an evenness of mind dwelling in a neutral state and a spontaneous abiding discordant with afflictions. So this is just peaceful, very, very peaceful, abiding and dwelling in this kind of neutrality. And this isn't quite immeasurable equanimity. This is really important. This is something that we need, but it's not necessarily the whole story when we're talking about immeasurable equanimity. Immeasurable equanimity is really the basis for impartial love, compassion, and bodhicitta. And here we're emphasizing our wish for the well being of everyone, which is not like a completely neutral stance. You are desiring something, you're wanting something to happen, you're cultivating a sense of responsibility, a sense of connection. And in order to do that, there's a lot of different methods to try and get you there. When we're doing these meditations on equanimity, there's the very classic form, which is just find friend, enemy, stranger, representative, see the way in which these labels come from you. Done, right? So, you know, easy in a sense. But if you're really doing the deep work, I think it's very useful to look at the dependent arising of everything about your process of labeling them and categorizing them. And this can be very confronting, but ultimately really release us from these kind of attached expectations that we have in relationships with those we're close to. And the kind of aversion and agitation and unsettled feeling when we're with people we don't particularly like. And to try and dismantle that sense of indifference to people that we've classed as strangers. So if you're looking at something like, why is someone nice to me? <laughs> it's a basic question, but it immediately pulls you into a conventional common sense that is vital. Why is someone nice to us? There's something in it for them. <laughs> most of the time. And, you know, that can immediately make our attachment disillusioned, which is good. <laughs> you know, if you realize that just as you tend to objectify people and see them as commodities and things to give you something that you want, even if it's an elevated altruistic something that you want, if you switch that around and look at other people do that to me, Part of you can be like a little offended, <laughs> you know, don't they see me, the human? But really, it can break the spell that attachment has on us to think others are kind to us, sometimes from love, sometimes from altruism, and often because of some attachment story of expectation of what it exactly I mean to them, the story of me to them. And that is a healthy disillusionment. 
it's a healthy disillusionment and it can reinforce things like renunciation as well. Looking at the way in which enemies feel like you hurt them, that also can touch your heart. You think, I don't want to hurt anyone, but someone feels hurt by me. Someone is feeling disagreeable when I enter the room. That's not how I want people to be. So just as these meditations, you look at your own projections and your own responses and the way in which they come from a million different causes and conditions, and so they cannot inherently exist, you can also put yourself in the other person's shoes. And that work, even though you don't really know precisely what's going on for another person, you can make an educated guess. And your work is really this educated guess of putting yourself in someone else's shoes. So if the underlying motivation is, I do this process of examining projections, both my own and theirs, in order to balance things, in order to stop having favoritism or preference in a concrete way. You know, you look at ideas of what is beneficial actually, as opposed to what is beneficial to my ego or to my temporary happiness and comfort. And then you realize the most difficult people, of course, are the most valuable. And then you start to just treasure them in a genuine way that's not forced. The people in your life who you're close to, and I've always thought of as beneficial, there becomes a little bit of spaciousness with that because you realize what you've considered benefit was often just benefit to the ego or benefit to your sense of reinforcing an inherently existent self, that they've been reinforcing the appearance, the very appearance that we're trying to get rid of, they validate. And that's not always useful, right? So the point is never to let go of love. The point is always to give more space for love to be more deep and genuine and expansive, as well as compassion. And then of course, bodhicitta, you know, so you're freeing up all this mental space that is usually crowded by afflictions. Remember how the nature of an affliction is something that makes the mind not peaceful. Equanimity brings you back to that peacefulness, that foundation where then you can add the higher qualities and they can stick. So I know that you know this, but just keep coming back to it, especially in terms of your daily life push and pull feelings, because it takes so much repetition to break the temptations of our own our old patterns of attachment and aversion and indifference. It really takes a long time to break the spell. So you have to do it on purpose a lot, intellectually, experientially, et cetera. So then kind of shifting gears to, okay, I want equanimity. Sometimes I have equanimity. Equanimity is reinforced by my understanding of emptiness. And how do I come to understand emptiness then? I use objects like friend, enemy, stranger. I also use objects like my own self, but not just the surface personality, not just this life's continuum of history, not even the ancestors and the culture I was born into, go to the mind. How is the mind empty of inherent existence? And so for this discussion, I think it's, it's useful to look at a very short passage from this book, Buddhism, One Teacher, Many Traditions, We've looked at this a few times over the semesters, but it's a very useful way to understand how even amongst Buddhists, we use words in different ways. So whether it's Sanskrit tradition or Pali tradition, um, the use of language in Buddhism can really vary. And so this can kind of um, help us clarify what precisely is being asked of us in terms of practice. So we're looking for the conventional nature of mind in a Mahamudra meditation. That's what we're looking for. And the conventional nature of mind is the clear and aware nature, focusing the mind on the mind, we, means one moment of mind, 
focuses on the moment of mind immediately preceding it. Yeah? And to do this, we need to know what the mind is and be able to identify it. When the mind is distracted toward external objects and internal conceptualizations, its own clear and aware nature is obscured. It's not gone, it's obscured. When it can be seen alone, its qualities of clarity, which reflects objects by arising in their aspect, and awareness, which knows objects, becomes evident. To identify the mind, gaze at an object with a muted, uniform color, and focus on the mind that is perceiving it. Immediately identify any distractions that may arise and return your attention to the clear and aware nature of the mind. As you do this, gradually these distractions will cease and you will perceive a stable, lucid state of mind. When the mind is able to remain in the present, undisturbed by thoughts of the past and future, we may experience a vacuum because we have removed our mind from its familiar focus on external objects. After some time of increasing the duration of this experience, we will glimpse the clear and aware nature of the mind. This is the mind that is the meditation object for developing serenity on the conventional nature of the mind. The practices of Mahamudra and Dzogchen both emphasize meditating on the mind itself to cultivate serenity. That's shine, calm abiding. The challenge with using the mind as the focal object is that because it's formless, we can easily slip into meditating on a mere conception of the lack of materiality or fall into a blank-minded meditation on nothingness. In both instances, we have lost the object of meditation. Emptiness as an object for cultivating serenity is only for those of exceptionally astute aptitude who have realized emptiness inferentially. Temporarily forsaking analysis, they concentrate on emptiness that has become conceptually understood. Here, there is some danger that if they lack clear ascertainment of emptiness, they will meditate on nothingness instead. So His Holiness is inviting us to try and just have a kind of a neutral mental appearance that gradually stops engagement with the distractions, very similar to every other meditation. It's just that there is less to centralize on than usual. Usually we centralize on an analytical structure or we centralize on a single pointed object that is a little bit more tangible feeling like the breath or like the image of the Buddha. In this case, you know, we're developing a single pointedness on something that is hard to really touch. But if you just kind of allow spaciousness while maintaining an alert mind, it's close enough, especially in the beginning. Yeah. So like many things, it's easier to understand by understanding what it shouldn't be or what it isn't. And what it isn't is vague or blank. Yeah. And so if it's vague or blank, you kind of, you know, flick yourself awake, come back to spacious clarity, meaning be alert to your experience. Yeah. So then we go back to the main verses, which kind of keep, in a way, reassuring us that this is something within our reach. So we're going to shift to some of the verses we haven't looked at before. So first, verse 11. But such vivid duality is not found on my mother's unveiled faith, face, I believe. From protracted discussions, missing the point, my old mother is liable to flee. And there's the Hebrew. Achsavu ani, kisaskoniyut shekazot, 
אינה נמצאת על פני מי, נטולות הצעיפים. רוב דיונים שמחטיאים את הנקודה, היא מי הקשישה עלולה לנוס. Things exist, but not in this way of stark facts rendered in dichotomies. For the inseparable bond of our loving parents is one of tenderness and joy. Likewise, many scholars and meditators amid Sakya, Nyingma, Karma, and Drupa pride themselves on their diverse terminology, reflexive awareness, subject-free, empty, and luminous, primordial purity and spontaneity, Samadabhadra's true face. Mahamudra, the uncontrived, innate nature, neither is nor is not, devoid of any standpoint. This is all splendid if the target is hit, but I wonder what you all are pointing at. מתגאים במונחים שונים ומשונים. הכרה עצמית, סלילות, ריקות, ולא אחיזה, תואר קדמוני וספונטני. פניו של סמנטה בדרה, מהמודרה, המולד ושאינו מאולץ. שאינו קיים ושאינו לא קיים. נטול הנחות כל שני. ועוד, היה זה מצוין אם היו הם קולעים למטרה, אבל תוהה אני על מה הם מצביעים. Since the innate nature can dawn through even contrived meditation, you elderly meditators need not be persistent, insistent, since one can uphold the absence of elaboration, of existence and non-existence, you stubborn logicians need not fret. This may all have evolved from not knowing the proper use of conventions by some wanting in erudition, I mean no disrespect. Do forgive me if I cause offense. So, to unpack all of that, um, there's a very beautiful section from Lama Yeshi's book, Mahamudra, How to Discover Our True Nature. So, we're going to start with a meditative reflection using Lama Yeshi's words, and you can either have your eyes closed and just listen as I read it to you, or if it's easier for you to track, you can look at the screen, but we'll start with that to kind of launch us into the meditation session. So if you want to shift into a meditation posture, I'll walk you through that guided reflection, and then we'll move into an actual meditation. Again, recentering by connection with the body, relaxing any tension.
with the foundation of equanimity, with the awareness of emptiness, may all sentient beings have happiness, freedom from suffering, and joy. Just reviving the motivation. And then sitting with Lama Yashi's words, he says, experience in meditation doesn't contradict conventional reality. When you meditate, you can reach a point where you have an experience of the non-existence of the self, objectively and subjectively, but you can misinterpret this experience. You can easily get the impression that therefore there is no I, no good or bad, no samsara, no nirvana, no cause and effect. In your daily life, you are so wrapped up in the relative mind, the grosser levels of mind, the conventional mind, that just naturally you think that everything is really existing, like in the supermarket all those existent things. And then in meditation, this egocentric I gets a taste of the non-existence of itself. And you have an emptiness experience. No conventions, no nirvana, no samsara. You can easily become nihilistic because of this meditation experience. You think it contradicts relative reality and therefore nothing exists. But having the experience of non-duality in your meditation doesn't mean that conventionally there is no self or anything else. There is. Cause and effect do exist. The Four Noble Truths do exist. When you stop your meditation and open your eyes, again you use your conventional mind, and again everything is there. But the relative I and relative phenomena are the truth only for the relative mind. They are valid only conventionally. The self and everything else is an interdependent phenomena appearing like a dream, like an illusion, but nevertheless functioning in its own way. So don't be confused by this and don't be afraid of it. Don't confuse the conventional and the ultimate. These two worlds do not contradict each other, even though you might think they do. Anyway, the relative I and relative phenomena are already existing within non-duality space, remember? They're not separate from it. They already have the no-self character, the non-duality character, the inborn nature of non-duality, of selflessness. That is their original character. They have always had this.
First realized the emptiness of this self-existent I, then other phenomena. Remember, even though we might comprehend this intellectually, that the self and all phenomena are in the nature of non-self-existence. Everything we experience through our senses and our mental consciousness still seems to exist as it appears to us dualistically. The minute we open our eyes, we perceive everything, including our own self, dualistically. Panchen Lama tells us that eventually, having familiarized ourselves in Mahamudra meditation again and again, as we have described, whenever you investigate in great detail the way any object of the six types of consciousness appears, the way it exists will dawn nakedly and vividly. Then he says, in brief, do not grasp at the inherent existence of whatever objects appear, such as your mind and so on. And always sustain with certainty the way they exist. With such understanding, all phenomena in samsara and nirvana are united in a single essence. You see, Mahamudra describes the universal reality of all existent phenomena, not just the self. But in the beginning, it's not important to describe the non-self existence of external things. First, we need to experience it in relation to ourself. We need to eliminate the concept of ego this unrealistic entity that has never existed in the past, doesn't exist now, and will never exist in the future. Once we've achieved that realization, experiencing the emptiness of everything else is easy. Having discovered the non-duality of our own self, we will discover the non-duality of the entire universe. Panjan Lama quotes the great Arya Deva, whoever sees one entity sees all entities. Whatever is the emptiness of one, is the emptiness of all. And so start by just sitting with that, those ideas. Repeat to yourself what has resonated or made particular sense to you. Or sharpen the edges of any questions you might have. So we'll start with just five minutes of free associating, particularly around the topic of emptiness of the mind.
where there is questions or doubt, see if you can refine them into the essence of their simplest form. What is it at the heart of your question? If something becomes clearer to you, repeat it to yourself so that you don't lose it. And now shift from reflection to meditation. And with the sound of the bell, try to bring your focus to the clarity of the mind directly. Spacious and non-reactive.
And as if from the side, briefly bring in your understanding of emptiness to the holding of your conventional nature of mind, its clarity and awareness. Just touch in very gently this clear and knowing awareness is empty of inherent existence. And come back to the clarity of mind with that background holding, knowing it's empty. And now staying in a meditative atmosphere, but shifting out of formal meditation, go ahead and write down any reflections or impressions that you've had or any questions you want to bring to tomorrow's session. So just gently shift from formal meditation back to personal reflection, just for a couple of minutes. So staying in your seat, write or reflect.
So we'll leave it there for now and just take a moment and dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, so have a nice break.